Returning now to one of our top stories, China's foreign ministry has criticised Australia's defence spending boost. The defence minister, Richard Miles, revealed yesterday an extra $50 billion would be spent over the next decade to modernise Australia's ministry in the face of the increasing threat from Beijing. Let's bring in now Professor Gordon Flake, CEO of the Perth US Asia Centre. Gordon, good to see you. Thanks for your time. China urging Canberra today, I see, to drop its Cold War mentality. It's denying China poses any risk to regional stability. Probably a pretty predictable response from Beijing today. Well, it certainly is, and it's one that kind of falls on deaf ears, not just in Australia, but throughout the entire region. So I was in Washington, D.C. this past week. Uh, you saw there not only a, a summit meeting between the U.S. president and the Japanese prime minister, but a trilateral meeting between Japan, the United States, and the Philippines. Uh, obviously, other countries in the region, not just Australia, are responding to what has been a decades-long military buildup by, by China. So the notion that they're is nothing to see here, nothing to react to, clearly is, is, is one that's not lost in Canberra or elsewhere in the region. And, and we saw in this uh, defending, defense boost uh, in terms of the spending, a lot of focus, of course, on the submarines program by AUKUS and also uh, the acquisition of missiles to Australia, clearly putting its focus on the sea in the region. And that seems to be pretty much in step with some of those allies you just mentioned. It certainly is. It's, it's, it's in step with the defense strategic review that came out last uh, year. And so to see this you know, a national defense strategy come out and begin to put some meat on the bones, if you will, is probably uh, encouraging in that front. Uh, we hosted in Perth in, in July of 20, or rather August of 2022, the first Indian Ocean Defense and Security Conference. And at that time, the chief of Navy was asked if he could have one thing, what do we want? He said missiles. And so, uh, again, this is not an area where Australia is an outlier. Uh, the the Filipinos are getting missiles from the from from the Indians. Everybody's looking to have the ability to project as a way of protecting their own homelands. We do keep being warned, though, Gordon, that in the shorter term before these submarines arrive in Australia, we're looking at a capability gap. When it comes to the near threat in terms of, of what we're facing in the region, what is the sense among these key allies as to what sort of timeline we could be looking at there? So this is one of the areas where I think the Australian public understanding hasn't kept pace with what's happening on the ground. Uh, so the initial announcement of a joint designed and built AUKUS submarine between the UK, the US and Australia, which wouldn't be ready until the 2030s or probably the 2040s, highlighted that capability gap. Uh, the, the fact that the United States has agreed to, to provide initially on a rotational basis, U.S. Virginia-class submarines based here in Western Australia, HMAS Sterling, in the best acronym in the history of government, Submarine Rotational Forces West, or SURF West, together with the U.K. and their astute-class submarines, begins to address that. Uh, but there's also the potential that over the next five years, six years, that Australia will be able to buy uh, as, as many as two to five U.S. Virginia-class submarines, which would dramatically increase our current capability long before we have to worry about the longer-range domestic production of AUKUS-class submarines. And so that capability gap has been addressed. It is being addressed. Uh, and, you know, the submarine rotational forces west should be up and running by 2027. So that's just scant two and a half years away. Gordon, you mentioned you've just returned from Washington, D.C. Very good of you to turn up on the television today after just landing, I think, in the last few hours. So thank you for that. What is your sense after speaking, no doubt, with a lot of political types in Washington, D.C., as to where things are at? when it comes to American politics, you're obviously a very close observer of US politics and have been for many years. Where do you think this is heading? Look, um, th there's one thing that is true, and it has been true now for several decades, is that America remains a deeply divided country. Um, and the margins are relatively close, and it's going to come down to a relatively small number of swing states in terms of the election itself. As of today, uh, the trend lines are looking pretty positive for the current President Joe Biden and a little bit less positive for former President Donald Trump. But uh, I think that Washington is a city that remains full of uncertainty and anxiety. Uh, and I don't think anybody is at this point, you know, feeling confident in the outcomes in November. 
Um, and as a result, not only is Washington paying attention to these campaigns, but the world is paying attention to them as well.